I was very fortunate to start my career with Senator Wallop, and I learned so many things from him that now that he's gone, a bunch of staff members and I have gotten together to create the Malcolm Wallop Fund for Conversations on Democracy in a way of honoring our beloved boss. Um, tonight's, we're just delighted that you're here. We're going to have a great time. As you might have seen on the um, PowerPoint up there, our beloved boss served as a senator from Wyoming to the United States Senate from 1976 to 1994. We lost him last year, and not a day goes by that we don't think about him. But I think he'd be really pleased to know that we're continuing discussing about his beloved democracy in um, events like this one, like the um, event this afternoon, and events throughout the state that will continue. Because Malcolm wanted Americans to think and talk about the issues. I really have to thank Ollie Walter in the College of Arts and Sciences, Mark Green in the American Heritage Center, for agreeing to fund this project, this dream that us Wallop alums had in the UW Foundation, who has collected all the money that we've raised in order to make this fund for conversations on democracy continue on for years to come. I especially like to um, recognize Isabel Wallop, um, Malcolm's wife, who we love. Isabel, I don't know if everybody can see, but you should wave at her and afterwards um, talk to her because she's fabulous. And then um, Malcolm's daughter, Amy, and her husband, Ken Hendrickson, are here, and they're fabulous. Amy needs to move back to Wyoming, so just afterwards talk to her about that. Not that we haven't talked about that. Um, and we have other special guests. We have the Chief Justice of the Wyoming Supreme Court, Marilyn Stebner Kite, and her brother, Ron Stebner. And it's thanks to the Stebner family that gave their estate gift, their family estate gift to this fund that has allowed us to do great things. So afterwards, say hi to Marilyn and Ron and thank them for their generosity because they kick-started something that's gonna last forever. We have in the room two-time UW Athletics Hall of Famer, Byra Kite, who was Malcolm's chief or um, state director for 18 years. I'm, I'm just thrilled that we have our Wyoming's new treasurer, Mark Gordon. So Mark, make sure that you wave and afterwards everybody talk to him. Wyoming is lucky to have him there. And um, we have Mary Meyer in the room, um, the, the wife and life partner of Wyoming's treasurer that we just lost, Joe Meyer. Um, Mary, thank you for being here so soon after the loss of a really good friend. Rob Wallace is here. He just retired from General Electric, um, a man with a plan. Now, if any of the students want to do some job searching, especially in technology, talk to Rob afterwards. And I would like to especially thank Leslie Wagoner from the American Heritage Center and Jan Ramza, who put together this event. I am sure that they would think that having a baby would be less work than putting this together. So we so appreciate the energy and thought and love that you've put into this. So all you students who have teachers that say, okay, put away your cell phone, turn out your cell phone, I want you to get them out. So if you have a Blackberry or an iPad or something, put on your Twitter feed. We're gonna be tweeting through the event, the hashtags at Wallop Fund. So if somebody says something that's interested, tweet away. And, and my tag is at Miss Christie, K-R-I-S-S-T-I. So we'll get to know each other and really be part of e-democracy tonight. So with that, it is my honor to introduce my friend, somebody I've known for years. I know, I, I know some stuff about this guy. I could, in fact, I could probably take some paola to give information on Bob Beck. But I will suffice it to say that 60,000 Wyoming people wake up to Bob's voice. So we are honored and, and blessed to have Bob Beck moderate tonight's event. So Bob, take it away. Exit. Well, thank you very much. We're going to introduce the folks who are going to speak to us, and we're going to start with Jimmy Orr, who's the managing editor, digital, and for the Los Angeles Times. 
for most of his career, he has been involved with Internet strategies for both politics and the media. He served as the press secretary for Wyoming Governor Jim Geringer. He was the White House spokesman and e-communications director for President George W. Bush. He was the e-communications director for Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger and was the online editor for the Christian Science Monitor. And Jimmy's an old friend. It'll be great to hear from him. He's got a lot of fun stories to tell you. And Jimmy, why don't you come on up? Bob, I'm over here. You're over here. Good to see you. I'm nice to up. see you. Oh, that, here's a photo. Yeah, that's right. We messed it up. Well okay, we're getting plugged in here. You know, Bob and I uh, go back, we go back 20 years. Um, when he was at Wyoming Public Radio, I was at Malcolm Wallop's office. We actually invented anti-social media. I'd call him up to complain about some story that he did. So, anyway, Bob and I invented anti-social media. Now, they're calling this the social media election. They always call it something. Every year since 1996, we heard the claim that this is a year of the digital election. This is a year of the internet. And really, back then, it was all about just having a website. As a press secretary for Wyoming Governor Jim Geringer, we had our Western-style website. That is impressive. I'm proud of that. Complete with very important graphics. Now, I thought we were really inventive back then because we scheduled him to do a live chat from the Republican National Convention in San Diego. It was cutting edge. We were crazy. But did you know this? Governor Geringer was the first elected official in the country to live webcast from his own website. It's true. Sounds impressive. Yes, it does. However, there were only a couple problems. One, it was 1996. Two, it was Wyoming. Not a lot of people tuned in. The grand total of nine. It gets worse. Five of those people were in the governor's office. So when our friend Joanne Barron called and asked how many people logged in, I did not lie. I accurately said, quite a few. Stunningly, she didn't push me, so I ran with it. All right, so 2,000 came, and it was more than just having a website. You could raise money on these things. Right after John McCain took New Hampshire in the primaries, he raised nearly a million dollars in 48 hours. I mean, this was a big, big deal. He was a model everyone was looking to. It's really innovative. Now, when I directed the internet strategy at the White House, we didn't have Twitter, no Facebook, no YouTube. We did have email, which was a powerful medium, but that's one way. And social media is all about the discussion. Wikipedia defines it as social software which mediates human communication. So we did participate in what is now defined social media, but you had to do it on our site. So we did a couple things. One, we ran this thing called, we hosted online chats, we called it Ask the White House, and allowed people to interact with administration officials. Some higher level people, and then occasionally lower level people. We also answered reader email on the homepage of the site. It was all about, but the, the, the issue was it, we controlled the message to a point. I remember telling Dan Bartlett, the communications director at the White House, that this was the safest medium ever. We would never go off message because we got to chose the questions. And only the, re only the readers uh, and media would see what questions we wanted to post. So... First person on the chat was White House Chief of Staff Andy Card. He took a question from a reader wondering where Saddam Hussein was. This was April 2003. Andy responded, I think he's dead. He wasn't. This became a big headline. Dan called me into his office the next morning. And he said, I thought you told me this was safe. 
I had a good response for Dan. I just told him to take it up with the chief of staff. All right, so in the meantime, digital strategies were evolving. We were connecting with people, but it was really Howard Dean's team that connected on a much different level. Online fundraising evolved. They had their meetups and much more uh, effective way of organizing with people. Had the scream not happened, who knows? But these guys were innovated. And this is the roots of social media. All right, so next up, I go out to Arnold Schwarzenegger's office, 2005. I continued to stress two things. One, that my face be on the home page always. <laughs> and two, that people wanted access to the elected official. They wanted to see Arnold. That's what we were pushing. So we did two things. We decided to live webcast every event regardless of location. We sent a cameraman who had a portable satellite dish with him everywhere the governor went. Basically, he looked like the Al Franken character from Saturday Night Live. And I'm really not exaggerating. <clears throat> we didn't care. We also held live video Q&As with the public. We were the first ones to do this from our own site. Based on the success that we had with Geringer's office, we knew we couldn't lose. Um, and it was really, it was, it was good coverage for the most part. I remember Wolf Blitzer saying, an internet first, and Governor Schwarzenegger's doing it. But then the one clip he showed was a question from a constituent who said, Governor, if you could be a color, what would it be? And then Schwarzenegger talking about why you like the color red. So it's not exactly the message that we wanted, but, you know, it was good coverage anyway. Uh, 2008, I go out to the Christian Science Monitor, uh, the online editor. We were the first major uh, news publication to drop the print product to go digital only. And I, one of my roles in the newsroom was to lead the blogging effort. I covered politics, and it was there that I was really able to see the significant change in campaigning. And uh, one of my primary focuses was studying what they were doing online. Okay, now they say 2012 is a year of social media, but I'm telling you, it, was, it, it all began in 2008. Because look at these four elements that collided. One, Barack Obama. Two, Sarah Palin. It gets better. Three, Joe the Plumber. And then four was Twitter. It was a perfect storm. We really saw for the first time that the public had a much larger voice. They could communicate with each other in mass scale via Twitter and Facebook. And posting YouTube videos was a significant part of Obama's digital strategy. There was a huge frenzy, for example, over the Obama's campaign texting the name of the vice presidential candidate. Nearly three million people received it. And then there was a McCain social media strategy, which was really kind of evolving. One of my posts back in August 2008 was headlined, Obama to text the VP, what about McCain? And then my illustrator created this graphic to go along with it. Um, but it, it, that is funny, folks. All right. And it wasn't, but it, it wasn't far off. I mean, the Obama team smoked them. Uh, Facebook. Obama had more than three times the supporters. Twitter, more than 25 times the supporters. On YouTube, Obama beat McCain by nearly four to one. I mean, they even advertised on video games. But... So let me ask you this, you can have all the numbers in the world, but what does it really mean? Well, one, with social media, you try to own the conversation. You want your message out, and this helped. They really tapped into something that hadn't been done before, and this is key, it was novel. His YouTube videos were watched for 14 and a half million hours, and you can raise money, they killed it. They raised $500 million online, and so, they, uh, they advertise in video games. In fact, their chief of staff was quoted as saying, I mean, dude, when you're buying commercials in video games, you are truly well-funded. So can we say that technology was a reason that Obama won? No. 
They just better used some tools. All right. Along comes 2012. I'm the managing editor digital for the Los Angeles Times. Great political team. Reporters, the best in the country. And being able to watch the campaign through the eyes of our two-time Pulitzer Prize winning cartoonist David Horsey was a lot of fun. But because of my position, I was unable to watch the election as nearly as close as I had been used to. But tried to pay attention to the social, uh, social media strategies they both employed. So every debate, I had my iPad on watching the Twitter reaction. And it was fun. There was a lot of great humor out there, including this. This is one of my favorites. But I love this one. But this is it. The question that people bring up is, is social media really just an amplification of gaffes or memes? Probably not, but there is that element. Every time I try to think of the real key social media moments, I mostly just think of the gaffes, and those were short-lived. Uh, I was impressed, however, when President uh, Obama went on Reddit, not once, but twice during the campaign, to interact directly with voters. In, in the latter discussion, more than two million people watched the 45-minute discussion. So that was smart. It was going to where the voters were. Uh, if you look at sheer numbers, it appears that 2012 was a repeat of 2008. But is it important just to have all these followers? You know, the guys at Twitter themselves say the number of followers isn't that important. It's about engagement. And so the Romney people were saying that you know, their rate of engagement was higher. And the Obama people will say the proof is in the end result. So there's a lot of different studies, a, a lot of d discussion. So the question is, how important was social media? Did it have seminal moments? Was it as powerful as 2008? Were the candidates too boring? Was it overdone? This slide may say it all. And with that, it's a fascinating discussion, and I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you very much, and we'll talk more soon. I'm just going to see Jimmy's tone things down since we last had a chance to chat with him. So, um, The next speaker is Rita Kirk, who's the director of the McGuire Center for Ethics and Public Responsibility. She's also a professor in the Division of Communication Studies at Southern Methodist. Her research is in the area of political campaign communication, and she's focusing on emergent technologies and the development of public arguments. Uh, as she's getting set up, I want to mention a couple of things. We've given you index cards for questions later on when the group of us meet up front here. If you have questions, would you please fill out those index cards and be prepared to send them to uh, just the middle of the aisles when that's ready. And then if you want to tweet, and we would encourage you to do that, you can talk about at Wallop Fund. If you have a question for us, you can tweet that question there as well. And then use the hashtag Wallop Fund if you would like to comment and tweet about uh, what we're talking about today. And uh, we'll try and retweet you and, and get you out there. So again, Rita Kirk is going to be our next speaker. And Rita, go ahead. Well, Glenn, um, we have some really different opinions about how, how social media works. I've spent a lot of time studying social media and particularly trying to figure out how we might be able to uh, demonstrate its impact. So I'm going to go through a lot of information to you for you really in a hurry. And the first one that we're going to try to go to, hopefully, is um, why Obama really should have lost this election. Um, first of all, his favorability ratings were the lowest of any incumbent since uh, 1980 with Jimmy Carter. Um, Obama scored negatives through much of the year on the benchmark polling question that most political scientists ask, is the country on the right track or the wrong track? And consistently between two thirds and three quarters of Americans thought we were on the wrong track. The jobless rate was high, as we all know, and voters' number one issue in this election was the economy. 
It was perceived to be in perilous condition, and early on, Romney was viewed as a better qualified candidate to manage it. So what we ended up with is a, is a deeply divided public that resulted in the campaign focusing on the undecided voter. This election will determine the future of our country, and this election will be determined by the undecided voter. It seems that more than 96% of voters have already made up their minds about this election. Well, I guess some of us are just a little bit harder to please. We're not impressed by political spin or 30 second sound bites. Before you get our vote, you're gonna have to answer some questions. Questions like, when is the election? How soon do you have to decide? What are the names of the two people running? And be specific. Who is the president right now? Is he or she running? Because if so, experience is maybe something we should consider. How long is a president's term of office? One year? Two years? Three years? Or life? If it's for life, frankly, we're not comfortable with that. We don't need to be electing a dictator. What happens if the president dies? Has anyone thought about who would replace him? What's your plan, gentlemen? Can women vote? Because if not, as a woman, I've got a big problem with that. And by the way, if men can't vote, in my opinion, that's just as wrong. We hear a lot about our dependence on foreign oil, but just what is oil? What is it used for? Can a woman have a baby just from French kissing? If you burn, fart, and sneeze at the same time, will you die? We are America's undecided voters. There's still a lot we don't know. And we want answers. Low Information Voters of America is responsible for the content of this advertising. Well, you get the idea, right? There were a lot of undecided voters, and while the Saturday Night Live skit is funny, the premise is a little wrong. Often, undecided voters were actually well-informed. They were just not very politically engaged. In part, they were not satisfied with either candidate. They comprised less than 4% of the electorate, and they were often torn between general party identification and specific policies that they believed deeply in. The campaign focus then was to find some way or someone to influence them. And that's where behavioral marketing meets political science. Ad companies began using browsing patterns. And I'm specifically gonna be talking about a lot of the things that the Obama campaign did. And I think when we start seeing that unpacked, we'll get a lot more information about what was successful about it. In part, when they were looking at these browsing patterns and doing the online surveys, they created a rich profile of users that flagged their likely interest, their demographic information, and in some cases, their political ideologies. The companies that can then place users into categories and offer campaigns the ability to shape their messages for each specific category. Political marketing companies then can take voter profiles and match those to behavioral factors such as who votes and where do they live, what are their interests, and who are their friends? And then who is likely to vote and how do we help make that process more simple for them? So let me give you a couple of examples then of how data mining was successful and how it was used. One of those is how to get people on your social media site. And in the micro-targeting world, what you begin to look for are hot words of things that voters are interested in. For example, some supporters thought that these words were really uh, important to them, contests, small dinners, and celebrity. And therefore, dinner with Barack is born. In order to do that, George Clooney hosted dinners on the West Coast, Sarah Jessica Parker on the East, and you would sign up for the website and you would participate in fundraising drives in order to be a participant in that. So it drove people to the social media sites and so that the Obama administration or the campaign could collect data and information. Another example is using social persuasion. The Obama campaign wanted to get back the people who had unsubscribed to them since 2008's campaign. And in order to do that, they tested message scripts and sought people who would influence those voters who had left. What they came up with was a Facebook campaign. And in the campaign, the campaign, the Obama campaign, would send you a list of your friends who had dropped off since 2008 and ask you 
to, to talk to them about rejoining. So again, you might not do it for the campaign, but you are likely to do it if it's one of your friends. So when we start looking at data mining in Facebook, there's a lot of information that we know. The old model was that you would like a candidate, you would repost campaign messages, and you would sometimes text messages yourself. The new model replicates the door-to-door, -door, get out the vote efforts. And in fact, Obama, as you see the little app symbol here, developed an app that literally permitted supporters to receive pictures of their friends in swing states. And then you could just click the button and you could send them a message that would say anything from please register to vote or remember that early voting starts tomorrow or remember today's election days, please make sure that you get to the polls. One in five people who received those messages, a full 20% of those contacted by a Facebook friend, acted on that request. And that's the power of social media. Um, when we begin to then to look at how the social media actually targets internet persuasion, we can also look at how they place their ads. Again, what we see is this process where you look at an initial search of words that you would type in on your, um, your computer browser, such as immigration or Romney campaign or Obama. You would then, um, companies would then collect data from that. And after that, and, and it goes to this this Uber group that um, looks at the websites and they are called web tracking companies. And literally it looks at where you've been, where you are now, and where you're going. And if they also monitor a company or an organization or a term that you go to next, they can make sure that an Obama ad appears at that next place. What you then end up having is in short a, a targeted campaign ad that seems to be available on all the issues I care about. Again, it's putting the message where people are and where they're thinking. Well, now that we have your attention, it's time for you to spread the word. And I want to be really clear when we start talking about social media. Social media is not just Twitter and Facebook. And this is an example of all of the various components of social media that go anywhere from social networks to threads to URLs to wikis and all the things that are currently being explored, including Reddit, which I agree is an amazing site and people ought to be paying a lot of attention to Reddit right now. But one of those that was particularly useful this election was Twitter. Uh, certainly, the, the new media in 2008, uh, was, it was a new medium in 2008. It was considered the medium in 2012, even though only 15% of adults still use it. Now, in contrast to what Jimmy said, I do think that it has some social significance because it fosters a discussion among voters in a democracy. I think that's exactly what we want to have happen. In the first presidential debate, there were 10.3 million tweets during the 90 minutes of the first debate. Hashtag topics like CNN debate linked people into conversations about the debates, or they had hashtag Big Bird permitting a spontaneous response to an event, or as in my case, real-time politic provides a link to analysis by people that you may like and or trust, and I hope you will um, join mine there at real-time politic. I'd like to talk with you. The bottom line is, it's a conversation, and that's what's really important. Now, just because it's a social medium doesn't mean that everybody and every campaign can go out and use it successfully. And so I want to make sure that you understand that just like in any medium, you have to carefully target the mediums that you use to make sure that you reach the voters that you're trying to reach. So this is why Twitter was an ideal medium for Obama. First of all, let's look at the characteristics of who uses Twitter, and some of this may surprise you. First of all, African Americans use Twitter at high rates. More than one quarter of online users are African American, 28%, and 13% of those use it on a daily basis. Hispanics are the second highest user group. Young adults, one quarter of them, or around 26%, um, are eight, of 18 to 29 year olds use Twitter, nearly double the rate for those ages 30 to 39. And among the youngest internet users, those 18 to 24, fully 31% of them are Twitter users. Urban and suburban residents are likely to be um, Twitter users as well. And they're more significantly more likely to be on it than our rural residents. So how does that then stack up to the election results? Well, 
Obama wins 93% of African Americans. Obama wins 71% of the Hispanics. He wins 60% of the young adult market. And he wins 69.4% of those in markets over 500,000. So if you think about what he's done, he's targeted his voters by using the medium that they would normally go to and that they like and trust. In this case then, Twitter empowers voters to become campaigners. And this is one of the things that's really interesting. Before 2008, it was really campaign-centered. And after 2008, moving into the 2012 election, supporters were permitted to actually develop their own campaigns. So campaigns would put out how-to videos and instructions on how to post, how to share, how to repurpose campaign materials. And essentially, volunteers were able to construct what they wanted of themselves. And here's an example. Um, in Obama's case, where they put on the website a way that you could fight the smears in the campaign. And where you see the little arrow over here, you will notice that it says, know the facts and get the truth. And then it says, once you have the facts, then you need to figure out how you're going to go tell your friends what the truth is. So it puts you, as the voter, working for them. Women in this election created their own wedge issue. The gender gap in this election is the largest in Gallup's history, the largest since they've been tracking that since 1952. Obama won the women's vote by 12%, Romney the men's vote by 8%, leaving us with a 20% gender gap. Part of that was caused by Romney's famous statement about binders full of women. If we had time, I'd play it for you. But one of the things that's important here is how women coalesced in order to say, I think there's something that we should be talking about here. On the next day, Experian Marketing Services that tracks the daily um, search terms found that binders full of women ranked 21st among all search terms that were put into um, search engines altogether. And that's an enormous number of people that were using that. So it created that sort of buzz, that water cooler effect that campaigns like to have happen. Um, the other way that you could use uh, social media, of course, was in field operations. In 2008, we used zip analysis, you know, that in your zip code and uh, talking to your neighbors. But in 2012, we used something called Obama data. It was a house-by-house -house analysis, and I will tell you that the Romney campaign did an, a, a good deal of this, although not as intensely as the Obama data uh, provided. Voters were literally, in the Obama case, given support scores and turnout scores, and it permitted them only to go to those households where they were likely to receive friendly or undecided voters. The field workers then had mobile devices like iPads with them. They could literally give the report of a doorstep conversation and send that back to campaign headquarters reporting what had just happened. Um, if you followed it all, and I'm not sure that many people have really explored this thoroughly, but Romney had a system called ORCA, which was designed to come out as his get out the vote drive on election day, and it failed miserably. In fact, they sent out the wrong passwords, the system crashed thinking that um, it was being attacked, and the result was that Romney poll workers spent much of the day just sitting there with no data, no phone calls, no get out the vote drive whatsoever. Now also in this election, one of the things that we noticed is that social media has become the news itself. And I just had to throw this little plug in because the data that you see at the bottom of the screen on undecided voters, the scrolling uh, EKG line, is the research that I did for um, CNN during the primary and general election this year. So what are the major lessons that we've learned from this? Well, the first one would be that quants using data are replacing political hacks who play on experience and hunches. Assumptions were rarely left in place without using numbers to really back them up. Secondly, we had a return to retail politics. Campaigns used Twitter and social media to make individual appeals to voters. Third, campaigns must continue to explore new media and help voters to become engaged. And finally, 2012 was won or lost at the grassroots level with people having conversations about democracy. Thank you. Once again, if you have index cards uh, with you, you can go ahead and fill out questions for any of our speakers, and we'll address those uh, after we're done. And then if you would like to tweet a question, you can do that at Wallop Fund, 
as well. Uh, Anne-Marie Lipinski is the curator of the Neiman Foundation for Journalism at Harvard University, where she oversees a fellowship program for some of the world's leading journalists and a variety of reporting efforts on the industry and the craft. So when it's her, uh, winner of the Pulitzer Prize for Investigative Reporting, formerly the editor of the Chicago Tribune and vice president for civic engagement at the University of Chicago. Anne Marie. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I just I want to start by saying uh, how thrilled I am to be here. This is my inaugural visit to uh, the state of Wyoming. So um, I want to thank my former Tribune colleague, Gracie, uh, for inviting me um, to join you all tonight. And um, I'm going to quickly get to sort of where we are today and uh, maybe talk more about uh, the user experience um, to bridge some of the um, really compelling things that um, uh, Bobby and Rita talked about. Um, but I wanted to um, maybe start by talking about um, Senator Wallop, who I never had the pleasure of meeting, but I did meet his daughter Amy tonight. And um, in talking to her, I asked her what he was like, so I would understand um, a little more about the man for whom this is named. And um, I asked her what he might think of social media as it was used uh, in the campaign, and um, we really started to talk about media more broadly and um, the change in politics and whether or not he would have liked um, what he would see uh, today if he were still here and, um, and, and a politician. So I want to take us back uh, to start to a time that Senator Wallop would remember well, and that would be September 26, 1960. I think um, every generation thinks that it um, is kind of discovering whatever it is uh, before them, and this is a generation that certainly feels like it has discovered technology. I know this because I have a 19-year-old year uh, daughter um, who, uh, you know, whenever I ask her to help me on my iPad or on the computer, kind of rolls her eyes as if, you know, why wasn't I born into this the way she was? Um, but the fact is, the date I reference in 1960 um, is really uh, maybe a moment to start with, uh, because that, to me, was a revolutionary uh, moment, and I think we would all agree um, agree that it was, it was the uh, day that the first of the four Kennedy-Nixon presidential debates were held at the CBS studios uh, in Chicago. Uh, you all know how the story ends. Um, for those who were listening on radio, uh, the majority of people believe that Vice President Nixon had won that first debate. For those who were watching on television, um, there was a very different conclusion. And it's important to remember that this was at a time, um, it had only been four years that the majority of Americans had a television set in their homes. Um, and that day, 70% of the adult population in this country watched those two men debate. And as uh, Newt Minow, uh, chairman of the FCC under President Kennedy, and um, the man who would later give the very famous uh, speech in which he referred to television, this is 50 years ago now, as the vast wasteland, a phrase we still use, um, Newt would later write that that debate changed um, campaigns and politics for all time, for better and for worse. So just to... Um, uh, to mark that moment and to flash ahead, um, I do think that there was something in 2012 that did change things for all time, as that debate did, as the use of television that, that, de that day did, um, and that was the use of Twitter. Um, I want to talk a little bit about numbers, um, if I could. One of the questions out there is, how did uh, Twitter do compared to television? Was it a more compelling medium this election? Um, and so it's important to go through a few numbers to understand that. Some 88.8 um, million people watched television on election night this year. 
That's down from where it was in 2008 when 71, um, uh, it's up from where it was in, in 2008 when 71.5 million people watched, uh, watched the newly elected um, Barack Obama. Um, you can break that down even further uh, by network or cable outfit. NBC led with 12.1 million viewers. Fox had over 11 million. ABC had over 10. CNN over 9. CBS almost 8. But one of the other things that was going on was this use of Twitter as a companion vehicle to television. So even though Twitter's numbers were not, to answer the question, was Twitter more powerful than television this time, Twitter's numbers did not achieve um, the numbers that television did. Uh, the Huffington Post says that in 2008, the then relatively new media so social media platform clocked 1.8 million tweets, not all of them politically related, on election day. But on election day this year, there were 31 million election-related tweets, a remarkable growth in four years, yet still fewer than half of the viewers um, we have on television. But what does happen, and what I think uh, the remarkable thing that happened that night, is not that television formed this town square, but that many of us were sitting in the town square formed by television while we were participating in multiple town squares, not just in our communities, but across the country and even across the world. And what you saw with the debates and um, on election night was this simultaneous experience of the daily we, which television provides, and the daily me, which um, Twitter uh, really um, encourages. And that's each of us curating our own experience, forming the community that we want to be in conversation with. Um, I experienced um, the debates and election night this year in a very unusual way. Um, as Bob mentioned, I run a program at Harvard that um, in part uh, gathers some very influential journalists for a year of study at the university, and these are journalists from all over the world. And I watched um, the debates and election night with them, and most of us were not just watching and commentating on what we were seeing on television, but we were also sitting um, with our smartphones or our tablets and communicating with um, hundreds of other people in our um, individually curated networks. So we were talking with each other, we were seeing what the nation was experiencing, but we were also in private conversation in a way with many other people, sometimes our conversations crossing over with each other as we sat next to each other by sending somebody a tweet or responding or retweeting somebody's um, commentary. And that, I think, was... Um, it was a, that was a new experience this year uh, for the nation, um, just as those pre that presidential debate in September of 1960 was a new experience uh, for the nation. Um, the other thing, though, that is important to remember, that there is this rise of Twitter, there is the power of Twitter, but there are very few, um, you, you can't yet make the case that um, there are individuals who are uh, more creating more powerful or, or creating more audience than legacy uh, media have done, television and in many cases still uh, newspapers. Um, the most talked about um, uh, journalist or reporter or statistician uh, more specifically uh, this year was a man by the name of Nate Silver. I'm sure you've heard that name. Um, famous for his at 538 um, Twitter account. Uh, and his um, prognosticating based on the polling this year was uh, one of the most written about and discussed uh, uh, you know, issues um, of the campaign season. Um, despite the attention Nate had, um, he, he, only, he has, which is a huge number on Twitter, 409,000 followers. Um, uh, but if uh, Ryan Lizza, uh, the New Yorker um, political columnist, a very big name in political commentary, has only 27,000 followers. Jake Tapper, 
an ABC reporter, uh, more than 200,000 followers, again, a very big number on Twitter, but still just a, a tiny fraction of the audience that he sees um, for his World News Tonight dispatches. Um, one of the biggest uh, accounts uh, for a journalist in this country would be Nick Kristoff of the New York Times, who has 1.3 million followers, a gargantuan uh, number in this world, down from Lady Gaga, but for a journalist, a huge, huge number. Uh, yet still nowhere near what his legacy institution, the New York Times, has, which on its general news account is, um, you know, six... Uh, 6.5 million followers. So I think what you saw was um, the fact that these legacy news institutions are still shaping the conversation and the debate that um, Nick Kristoff as an individual would be unlikely to have the following that he does, that it is his standing at the times and the power of his individual voice in combination with a legacy institution that is really um, driving the debate. Um, one thing you do see is that some of these individuals, Christoph being an excellent example, um, have created audiences that uh, are larger in number than what um, most of the mainstream, um, you know, big legacy metro newspapers have. If Nick were a newspaper, he would be the fourth largest circulation, he would have the fourth, fourth largest circulation in the nation. Um, behind the, the Wall Street Journal that has 2 million, USA Today 1.8 million, and just behind his own newspaper, which is just over a million and a half, and above uh, the Los Angeles Times, which the ABC numbers uh, most recently put their daily circulation at 605,000. Um, I also wanted to talk about this who's shaping the story question and how social media is being used for that. There was a Washington Post story that talked about you know, sort of the new boys on the bus phenomenon. And it said, the old journalistic hierarchy that once aggrandized major newspapers and national networks has flattened out, giving any boy, girl, or baby on the bus with a Twitter account the same opportunity to drive the race as the most established uh, brand names. Um, I think that's a little bit um, hyperbolic uh, in, in 2012, um, though likely to trend in that direction. As I said, I still think it is, the most dominant voices are still those that have some institutional um, connection. Uh, I wanted to just add two other things, and one is that at the same time that we were seeing this tremendous um, growth in the use of Twitter uh, for the campaign and uh, the debates and the election, um, something that I think was truly remarkable was the way you saw it used during uh, Hurricane Sandy. And I think um, even more so than with uh, the campaigns this year, Twitter proved itself as a highly utilitarian uh, vehicle for conveying information and creating communities. Um, and I don't want to say a lot more about that right now, but just to mark that as a really interesting, I think it got lost in the conversation about the use of social media on the campaign, but I think it was an amazing phenomenon. And then the last thing I wanted to say is, um, as we talk about this and reminded again about my conversation uh, with Amy earlier tonight and how her father would have thought about the tenor of the political debate, um, I think there's both bad and good, as there was um, uh, uh, with, with television and the rise of the use of television um, to document campaigns starting in 1960. Um, and you see that with social media um, as well. Um, there is a meanness about some of what we see uh, tweeted or posted on Facebook. Um, it encourages snark, uh, as my daughter might say. Um, there's a kind of quick hit, drive-by, shooting nature um, to a lot of the commentary um, and audiences that reward that very clever and sometimes um, mean-spirited uh, remark. I also think it's a medium in which a lot of America's is very unrepresented or underrepresented, and that would include middle-aged and elderly uh, Americans. At the same time, um, I thought one of the most interesting statistics was that uh, for the first debate, there were 11.1 million tweets this year, and 55% of those came from women, 
45% for men. That is a hugely different ratio than you see if you talk about, if you look at who was covering the campaigns for mainstream media. So um, as some voices are being suppressed, others are uh, rising up in a way that they have not been able to um, in some of the more traditional uh, news organizations. Uh, so with that, I look forward to the conversation with the rest of the panelists tonight. Thank you so much.